Three years earlier in 76, I mean, Iran was booming as far as we could tell. Uh, there were uh, actually these huge middle class housing developments were being built, some actually by William Levitt, who built Levittown. Um, the northern part of Tehran, I mean, we, we saw admittedly the elite of the elite, uh, you know, looked like Beverly Hills or Bel Air. Uh, people had large villas. And uh, the only thing that was really different was that they had Persian rugs beside the swimming pool. And, and uh, the, um, you know, we, so we went to dinner at the house of uh, the Iranian ambassador to England. And, uh, you know, we were seeing, let's say, a, a, a very special scene, I suppose. But it was very cosmopolitan, very sophisticated. It was, uh, women were obviously completely uh, free. And uh, um, Christians and Jews seemed to be rather prominent in the uh, society around the Shah. Mm -hmm. um, one day we did go to the bazaar, the old bazaar in the southern part of Tehran, which was the poorer part of the city. And there we did see uh, women in chadors and black chadors. And it was very crowded. And as I recall, every so often, you know, we were speaking with our American accents, um, somebody would hiss at us. Uh, I thought it was because we were Americans, but recently someone said, no, it might have been because you were with Iranian women dressed in Western, Western clothes who, you know, were not your wives or, I mean, the, you know, they did whatever. They were, that was the only hint we had of some, <coughs> something brewing. Um, I never heard the word Shiite, I mean, in 10 days. And so when Andy went to the White House, um, uh, he later said, because uh, he was very excited about going, Andy would get very, when he, when he got really excited about something, he would dye one eyebrow black and one white. <laughs> and, and he actually wore a tuxedo that night. He would wear a tuxedo jacket with jeans. But that night, he actually put tuxedo pants over his jeans. He That's said, wool, wool pants, it <laughs> ship. And uh, when he came back to the hotel, we. we uh, a few of us went with him because he never wanted to go anyplace alone. But we had to wait at the hotel. He came back and said, oh, the Empress was so sweet. and She was so beautiful. The Shah was very cool <laughs> to me. He, said, he was not that friendly. He said, but after dinner, he, the Empress kept following him from room to room. And he, he said he was running from the green room to the red room to the blue room because he was so afraid she was going to ask him to dance. <laughs> and later, the Empress, years later, told me, no, I just wanted to have a conversation with him about his art. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, my take on Iran. We, we, we saw a lot of, I think it's important to note that the Iranian embassy here in New York, the, the mission to the United Nations, was really, in many ways, the most interesting embassy. Ambassador Hoveda had been a, a film critic for Cahiers du Cinema in Paris. And uh, so he would give dinners for visitors from Paris like Francois Truffaut, Louis Malle, Rudolf Nureyev, Karl Lagerfeld. And at these dinners, you would meet everyone from Sidney Lumet with his mother-in-law, Lena Horn, um, to Diane von Furstenberg and Marisa Berenson. Adrian Hoveda was really always trying to help Andy and trying to get commissions. And I mean, he, he loved art and artists, you know, and he, he made wonderful collages himself, actually. And, um, so he gave a dinner for Princess Ashraf, and at the dinner, he persuaded Princess Ashraf to let Andy take Polaroids of her right there in the embassy. Nice. And then I remember um, uh, Princess Ashraf invited Andy and myself to a, a dinner dance she was having at her townhouse in Beekman Place. And she had this kind of somewhat mysterious reputation. I mean, people said, that she, she was the Shah's twin sister. And people said the Empress was kind of the good influence, and Princess Ashraf was the not so great, great influence. This was sort of the gossip <laughs> of, uh, that, that we had heard. But anyway, we, we went to this dinner dance, and it was so remarkable because you walked in, and that year Yves Saint Laurent had done this couture collection called the Jewel Collection, all these big taffeta gowns in emerald green and sapphire blue. And Princess Ashraf and her court had were all dressed in gowns from that collection. And Andy said, oh my god, it's like a Visconti movie, because it was like, <laughs> like they had been, you know, they had like been dressed by costume designers. Yeah, yeah. Because normally you'd go to a party like that, and some women would be wearing Halston, and some women would be wearing San Laurent or Valentino, but they wouldn't all have the same oh, right. dresses from the same collection. <laughs> and it was, it was, you know, Andy loved all that kind of stuff. I mean, Andy was, 
basically a liberal Democrat, I hasten to add, but he was also starstruck. And for him, you know, not only royalty, but political leaders in general, on one hand he would say, oh, they all just want money, they all just have their hand out. On the other hand, he was fascinated by anyone who had a certain degree of fame. And he had done portraits of Willy Brandt, uh, who was a socialist uh, chancellor of Germany, mm -hmm. and of Golda Meir in Israel, of Jimmy Carter, of Ted Kennedy. So, you know, um, uh, it wasn't only the Shah and the Empress. Mm -hmm. uh, Hmm. But, uh, you know, he, he was fascinated by, mm -hmm. as, as we all were, what was going on in Iran. It yeah. was very much a country that was in, in the focus of world attention under the yeah. Shah, and, and, and in the art world in particular because of the Empress building these museums. Hmm. Yeah, I think that that's in fact one of the real messages in the exhibition, which is the fact that in contrast to today, there were, there were so many connections between the US and Iran, not just culturally, but also politically.